Welcome to the MacArthur Memorial Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Williams. Join me as we explore the life and legacy of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and discuss a wide range of military history topics from the American Civil War to the Korean War. The following is an interview between MacArthur Memorial Archivist Jim Zobel and James M. Fenelon, author of Angels Against the Sun, a World War II saga of grunts, grit, and brotherhood. Well, welcome everyone. MacArthur Memorial today is very fortunate to have James Fenelon with us. James is the author of Four Hours of Fury, which is about the 17th Airborne, uh, but he's got a new book out, and this one is about the 11th Airborne, uh, which fought under MacArthur in World War II. It's called Angels Against the Sun, and it's a World War II saga of grunts, grit, and brotherhood. James, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the invitation. It's great to be here. Now, just to get us going, um, this being your second book about paratroopers, what is it that really has drawn you to this this story of of the, the paratroops during World War II? Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, it goes back to my own my own service. I was a paratrooper for a period of time and have the privilege of, of going through jump school at Fort Benning and kind of being steeped in the in the history of the, you know, the early airborne units, which, of course, got started right before World War Two. And it was something that always stuck with me. And of course, there's the well-known units that we're all familiar with that we learn about in high school history class, of course, during D-Day. And if you're lucky enough to have a, a teacher that'll go into Market Garden, maybe you learn a little bit more about some of the bigger airborne operations in Europe. Um, but later on, as I started developing my own interest in, in increasing my knowledge of, of those units, I realized that there were certain, you know, there were several actually um, <clears throat> forgotten airborne units from World War II, those units that kind of got started right when the war started, like so many divisions in the U.S. Army ceased to exist after after the Army started to downsize after the war. And so to your point earlier, I started with wanting to tell the story of the 17th Airborne Division in the crossing of the Rhine River. And, you know, right after that on, in my sights was telling the story of the 11th Airborne Division in, in the Pacific Theater. And their role is, as you well know, is is often overlooked in that campaign as well. You touched on uh, just there and you were looking at uh when these guys were training, you know, and all these brand new units that are coming out. Paratroops really a, a brand new realm of, of the American military at that time. Um, can you tell me the kind of training that these guys had to, you know, go through how the 11th Airborne came together? Yeah, the 11th was formed in Jan, or I'm sorry, February of 1943. It was one of five such divisions. And of course, when we're talking about World War II airborne divisions, we're talking about a unit that's specifically trained to go into combat via parachute and glider, which of course is not a technique that that we use any longer, but was something that was very big and important um, during World War II as a way to kind of make up for the lack of aircraft. You can kind of make the analogy, if you will, almost of like the gliders from World War II or the Black Hawk helicopters of today. They were able to, to deliver troops in a single point into a landing zone. So they had the advantages of, of, of landing, you know, 12, 18 troops together as opposed to being scattered by a, bar- by a parachute drop. And so the 11th Airborne had two glider infantry regiments and then a single parachute um, infantry regiment, which was kind of the model of the other divisions that the Army fielded during the war. The parachute units were uh, comprised of volunteers. Um, those guys had, they may have been drafted into the Army, of course, um, during service for World War II, but in order to uh, go to jump school, to go through that training, they had to volunteer. The Army wasn't going to, and still doesn't force anybody to go <laughs> jump out of an airplane if they don't want to. Um and then you have the glider guys. And, you know, and I think it's worth kind of stating maybe what's kind of cliche these days. But, you know, most of these young men, when they enlisted or were drafted into the into the service, had never been in an aircraft. And so many of them for their first time were jumping out of airplanes the first time they were ever inside of one. Or I would think would be even worse would be uh, riding in an engineless glider for the first time you've ever taken flight. That had to be uh, terrifying, frankly. Right. Um, now, they're at, they're at two different camps, right? I mean, the 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 airborne guys, they, they're they down there in Georgia, the 511th, and they, they have to do that Curahy Mountain training and everything that we've all seen. That's right, Jim. Yeah, the 511th got started a little bit earlier before the 11th actually started forming. So the 511th was around like two to three months before they became attached to the 11th Airborne Division. And of course, they came into the division as such with their own kind of personality or culture as a unit, if you will. To your point, they were running up 
Mount Curhey there at uh, Camp Tacoa, the famous where the Band of Brothers right, yeah. trained. One of uh, one of the platoon leaders in the 511th was kind of infamous for running up Curhey backwards <laughs> so that he could keep an eye on his men while they all ran up. So it was a bit of showmanship there uh, to kind of set the leadership bar high. Now, what's your take on the commanding officer of the division, Joe Swing? Um, you know, always seems to be a very capable person. But sometimes, you know, as it comes to in your book, it's it's not always a happy family between like Swing and some of his regimental commanders. I mean, he is the commander, but these guys have their they have their own thoughts on how to train and how to do their own thing. Yeah, that's right. And I think, um, you know, Swing's an interesting character, to your point, extremely capable, one of the most overlooked ground commanders the Army produced. During the war, he was a West Point graduate, uh, graduated in the same class as Eisenhower did in 1915. And it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting observation to your point about the personalities. He kind of came in to the airborne, if you will. He was um, in 1942. He was the uh, division artillery commander for the 82nd Infantry Division as it was going through its transitional process into becoming an airborne division. So he kind of came in some ways into the airborne uh, perspective, I guess, later, um, as opposed to his 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 regimental commander, uh, uh, Oren Haugen, who had been in airborne units and jumping out of airplanes since early 1940. And those two guys really had a very different perspective on how to how how airborne units should comport themselves, I guess, right? Swing looked at it very much as a unique commute. He was, uh, he, you know, he felt, you know, jumping out of airplanes or landing from gliders was just simply a way to get to the battlefield. He was certainly intrigued by the idea of vertical envelopment, the idea of being able to land behind your enemy for the first time um, in, in warfare. Whereas the commander of the 511th, Orrin Haugen, almost almost viewed his his group of paratroopers as warrior monks, for lack of a better word, right? He viewed this rigorous airborne training as a selection process as a way to weed out the guys that that didn't really want to be there and kind of approach it from from that perspective a very you know independent mindset almost almost like we viewed the the ranger battalions in the 1980s right these small units that were originally designed to be attached as shock troops to units withdrawn and and go back in and so you really had a different perspective there initially but i think that the two men while they didn't necessarily see eye to eye had a had a mutual professional respect for each other. And that really came through as the way that the division fought its battles. It was like a melding of these two perspectives. Um, and I don't think they would have been successful if they had gone down one road or the other. Right. And that that's what I thought was the interesting part of your book was, you know, even though these guys have these extremely, you know, different perspectives or different ideas on, on how they want to do things, uh, they don't let it get in the way of, of their effectiveness. You know, it do, it doesn't muddle their 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 military ability at all. That's right, and I, and yeah. I think you know it's always it's always fun to look at history for examples and lessons that we can learn. And I think now it's kind of an interesting point that these two guys had differences of opinion. They certainly were known for getting in arguments. You know, there was a, as I'm sure you remember from the book, there was that infamous scene over dinner where they were, you know, a colonel is yelling at at, at the two star <laughs> commanding general, and he's yelling back and. You know, everybody's trying to slowly remove themselves from the room to get out of the crossfire. But at the end of the day, the next day, you know, they continued on with that again, that kind of that mutual respect where Swing could have easily have relieved Haugen for that right, right. insubordination. But I think he saw the value there and what he brought to the table. Another part of that is um, you know, after after five eleventh is at Tacoa and they show up, you know, with the rest of the eleventh, the jump boots are a very prized you know, commodity for, for paratroopers. It's the thing. And Swing kind of makes use of that immediately when Haugen gets there, doesn't he? Yeah, that's right. I think it's it's interesting because, again, that goes back to this idea that, you know, organizations, particularly the Army, likes uniformity. They want everybody to look the same for, for obvious reasons, particular going into World War II, mass production. You know, everybody's got to be in the same uniform, the same helmet, the same boots. Uh, paratroopers had, um, right before the war, created, designed their own special boot that gave them better ankle support um, for jumping out of airplanes and, you know, crashing down to earth. And it was uh, William Miley, who was one of the early airborne commanders, that kind of came up with this idea of instead of wearing the traditional army leggings and, and shoes, his his guys would wear their jump boots with their dress uniforms and blouse the pants into the top of the boot so they kind of show it off. And it really became a 
a status symbol. It was very different at the time for what the rest of the army was doing. Uh, you can go back and look at period recruiting movies or recruiting ads um, that the Airborne was putting out, the paratroopers were putting out, and those boots featured very prominently in that. Um, so it was a unique status symbol. And of course, as soon as they arrived at the 11th Airborne Division, Swing wanted to kind of bring them in line with the rest of the division and immediately ban them from <laughs> wearing them for a period of time, which uh, was a huge morale crusher for for these guys. They did not like looking like everybody else in the division. Um, and so it kind of was the first time that the 511th started to kind of have this personality conflict with Swing uh, <laughs> that reoccurred throughout throughout their relationship. Now, how did how did the 11th, they, they get that nickname, the Angels? And it's it's not really a uh, a positive thing. <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> they call them the angels, but it's you know kind of for a, an ulterior you know motive. That's right. That's right. They later turned it into you know post post war marketing turned it into kind of a positive thing uh, based on some of the the actions that maybe we'll talk about in a little bit. But initially, what happened was you know Swing was fifty one years old at the time that he took command of the Eleventh Airborne. The average age of the enlisted guys in the division at the time was 19 <laughs> years old. And so you can imagine um, now Swing had the privilege of being able to raise the 11th Airborne Division from basic training all the way up. And so he was really able to put his stamp on the division from the get go. The unit, you know, with the exception of the 511th, the division went through basic training and, and then advanced training all simultaneously together, which is a tremendous advantage as you can imagine. But what started happening was, as these guys were getting their weekend passes after completing some of this training, you know, they were going out and hitting the town. And, and much like young men do the world over, they're bored when they're on post, they're looking for, you know, to vent some steam. And so they would routinely get in trouble, fist fights, <laughs> drunken, you know, the, the basic stuff. And it was on one Monday morning that one of Swing's, um, unit commanders asked his junior officers rhetorically, he said, how many of our angels are still in jail this morning? And that kind of became his go-to comment every Monday morning before formation to find out how many guys were he was going to have to go bail out. And it kind of stuck. And then Swing heard about it. And eventually he too started referring to his men as my angels in that right. kind of, to your point, that sarcastic reference. Now, in going to uh, the Pacific, you know, when they first get out there in May, originally they had thought they were going to Europe, didn't they? Yeah, there was a lot of debate within the division. You know, a lot of the guys, you know, like anything, you know, the rumors are going back and forth, sure. the scuttlebutt. Most of them felt like the Pacific was did not lend itself to division airborne operations. And in some ways, they were obviously correct about that, but for probably different reasons than they thought. Um, you know, and it was interesting, one of my presumptions that I had made when I started writing the book was that most of these guys would have preferred to go fight in Europe over the Pacific, just because now, of course, in hindsight, we have much more, you know, fidelity as to what those conditions were like in the Pacific. Yeah. And I was I was surprised to learn how many of the veterans actually had enlisted as a response to Pearl Harbor and were actively wanting to go fight the Japanese in the Pacific ah. in a response to that. And it was so it was interesting to kind of remind myself as a historian, I kind of had to take some of these right. ideas and set them aside and, and and let these guys speak for themselves as far as what, what they thought. Um, but yeah, they were. And then, you know, and then it changed when they got to uh, Camp Polk in Louisiana. Many of them assumed that they were in the swamps training for the Pacific, and then one of the other units that was there went to Europe. So that kind of dashed that concept. And then, of course, when they eventually landed in the Pacific, they realized that Louisiana had very little in common with the Pacific Islands and what the terrain was like they were going to be fighting in there. Well, let's add on, on that. You know, I I wanted to talk maybe a little bit more about the moniker of the angels in New Guinea. But when they get to New Guinea, that's really where they get that serious training that's going to come in so valuable on Leyte, isn't it? That's right, Jim. They had the advantage of of um, landing on Leyte. They had several months on their hands before they were committed to combat. They used that time again. I, I, I attribute this to Swing and Haugen. They you know, initiated a series of very realistic training exercises, and we know they were realistic because, unfortunately, several men were killed um, in live fire training exercises. They had the advantage of uh, working with the Australian combat veterans who ran them through some jungle schools. Um, some of the um, reconnaissance troops in the 11th Airborne Division actually had the advantage of of going to the Alamo Scout School, which is kind of a famous 
precursor right. to some some ranger units and things like that. So they they did take advantage of that time on New Guinea to really get um, as much up to speed, I would argue, as any any unit that was in the in the had that had opportunity to do that kind of training. Yes, because they're they, I mean they're right there where the really on the battlefield of that first campaign at Bunagona Sonananda, right there, Dubadura, where they're where they're you know parked right there. So uh, those conditions are as bad as anywhere in the Pacific, I think. Now, when the 11th goes into combat, uh, it's 1944, and they get thrown into Leyte, um, kind of about a month after uh, the campaign has started. And they get really one of the most grueling tasks of this campaign. Can you tell us about what they're going to encounter when they get on Leyte? Yeah, absolutely. To your point, they arrived about a month after the main landing. Um, Their initial assignment was so you know, if we think of Leyte as kind of a long island with a long spine, the central mountain range kind of bisecting the length of that island, the troops that had previously landed, the divisions there were in the process of either cutting around to the north of those mountains or going around south. Um, the Japanese were landing thousands of reinforcements on the west coast. Um, the initial landings by MacArthur had taken place on the east. And so there, you know, the conditions on Leyte were they had been raining for about 30 days at this point in the campaign. Um, There weren't very many, if any, paved roads on the island at all. So most of these roads were all now muddy quagmires. Um, There were no roads that went up into the mountains. And that was why um, the other divisions were kind of sweeping around to the top or the bottom of those mountains to kind of get around them. The 11th was tasked with marching directly up into the mountains to occupy uh, trails and passes that were up in that central mountain range and to block Japanese reinforcements from coming down into Leyte Valley. Um, The terrain was significantly uh, a significant challenge, I should say. It was extremely steep. I remember one account by a veteran that he could talk about standing on the trail and putting his arm out directly in front of him and touching the side of the mountain that they were in the process of, of climbing up. And like most green units, you know, this was the 11th first combat operation, and you could probably still go to Leyte today and follow the trail of discarded equipment, (laughs) gas masks and blankets and all the stuff that they were carrying as they initially started making their way up into the mountains and learned very quickly that they were carrying way too much. Yeah. Now, the logistics of this thing uh, going over these mountains, I mean, they've trained as paratroops, they've trained as glider troops, but now they're pretty much hardcore infantry. And when you're going into these mountains, you're pretty much immediately cut off from everybody behind you, except by runners. So, I mean, this is a a nightmare of logistics, trying to get supplies for things like that. How do they do all that? Yeah, it's a great observation, Jim. As a matter of fact, the troops referred to their time on Leyte as the, quote, long nightmare. And it was, to your point, they had to carry, they had to man pack everything up into the mountains. So you're talking about carrying all your rations, you're talking about mortar rounds, ammunition, all these things had to be pushed up the sides of these mountains. Um, Just the very act of sitting down to take a break, you know, you're now immediately filthy because of all this mud and the rain and everything else. Um, They did get far enough into the mountains and identify a, a flat plateau that they were able to identify as a good position for a forward operating base. They immediately started hacking down the trees to widen that drop zone a little bit. And this, again, is, I think, where we kind of see that combination of Swing and Haugen's mindset, right? And, you know, air aircraft, support aircraft on Leyte was extremely difficult to come by. I think there were only six C-47s on the island for, for multiple divisions that needed, you know, to be moving supplies around. And so Swing's first step was kind of this interesting, you know, what I view as kind of an innovative use of his division's capability to expand the footprint of that that plateau, he uh, tapped a platoon of his combat engineers to parachute them in to the jungle out of observation aircraft. So literally, you know, L4, L5 aircraft, these guys are shoving themselves in the back seat, taking their static lines and literally just wrapping the static line around the spar of the chair behind the pilot. And this, you know, these aircraft would putter over the jungle. One guy would drop out at a time. And so you can just imagine this, you know, constant buzzing of these these little aircraft flying right. over to drop these guys in. They immediately started expanding that footprint, as I mentioned. Then to keep his campaign moving, Swing knew that he needed that infantry that was already up there to uh, keep pushing up into the mountains, but they still needed to secure the perimeter of that forward operating base. And so he, again, 
took a company of his glider infantry that he had cross-trained as paratroopers, and then same kind of thing, started loading them into the back of this aircraft, dropping them one at a time. These guys then took over manning the perimeter so the 511th could keep pushing up into the mountains. Right. And then, you know, and then it was just a constant, um, you know, supply chain issues of trying to get, you know, drop supplies in when they could. Sometimes pilots were just flying over this jungle opening and literally pushing out crates of ammunition or crates of food. And then, of course, became they then had to carry it up to the front line as it got longer and longer as they pushed their way across the island. Well, in your in your title, you talk of the word grit. And that's what really comes through in this uh, story of this drive across. I mean, there's been many books that have, you know, talked about this drive. And I don't think people realize the Japanese were fighting to the death at every step. It was it was very almost a scene out of the macabre. I mean, you talk about Japanese soldiers being killed and standing there for a week, you know, after they've died. But the tell us about some of the guys they had to leave behind. And and the the one thing that was really, really got me was. The chloroform story. Yeah, sure. That is that is a, a, a it's that story is hard to forget, isn't it? Um, so I think one of the things that the eleventh realized very quickly into their campaign was that they could not underestimate the tenacity of of the Japanese. And I think it's worth mentioning that the eleventh up in those mountains was pretty much fighting the Japanese um, on their own terms. Right? They were up in the mountains. The mountaintops were almost constantly covered in fog and clouds, which meant that they couldn't call in or rely on American um, air support because pilots couldn't necessarily see what they were, where they were supposed to be dropping their ordnance. Um, the maps that they had were literally hand-drawn maps um, by, by engineers who had roughed in as best they could the ridge lines and the mountaintops. And so calling in uh, these large artillery barrages from the coast was really a non-starter because, of course, when you call in artillery, you really need to know where you are when you're doing that. And that was something that they never were really 100% sure of where they were. So they had limited support from both air support and artillery. Um, and they quickly realized that the Japanese soldiers up in the mountains were very good at counterattacking. They were very fast when they decided to make an attack. And the story that you were referring to occurred... Um, with one of the units in the 11th Airborne Division was almost getting cut off. They were fighting a withdrawal back to a hilltop to where they could kind of consolidate into a circular perimeter. There was a rear guard action where the unit was kind of fighting their way back up this hill as Japanese soldiers were, were swarming up um, both sides. Um, there was a medic um, in that rear guard action who was who was trying himself to escape before they got cut off. He came across a, a wounded comrade um, who he was unable to carry um, due to himself being wounded, if I recall correctly. And he was put in this in this horrible position of having to make a decision as to do I do I leave this guy here who's still wounded and perhaps fall into the hands of the Japanese? Do I try to carry him and maybe we both get captured? Or the ultimate you know decision that he made at that time was that he overdosed his patient with a with a fatal dose of morphine uh, in the hopes that he would you know uh, view it as an act of mercy of saving his you know saving him from a much worse fate if he had fallen into uh, and been captured by the Japanese. Just having to be put into that position is just you know the the worst. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's one of those things where, you know, fortunately, it's it's unfathomable for many of us to to have to think about those kinds of decisions. Yeah, what these what these young kids actually had to go through. Now, after Leyte, the 11th Airborne is going to move on to Luzon for that that final big push on on the island um, there, and they're going to get pushed over to the Eighth Army um, under Eichelberger, and now. They're going to be an amphibious unit <laughs> going in. Um, can you tell us about how they got put into this this job? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, just a quick shout out to Robert Eichelberger, a, a, another one of my favorite commanders, um, often overlooked for his his role in the Pacific, but he uh, was quite a personality. He and Swing got together. I like to refer to them as like peas in a pod. They both were very aggressive uh, ground commanders. They both believed that uh, the best way to keep the Japanese um, on 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 the defense was to have a very strong offense and keep pushing them to where they didn't have a chance to consolidate and reorganize. Um, MacArthur tasked Eichelberger with a series of, uh, you know, there's always an argument, what's the best word to use to describe these? I prefer to, you know, I, I like the word diversionary 
attacks. So as the main um, attack on Luzon was heading south down to Manila, that campaign, as you well know, wasn't going as, as fast as MacArthur would have preferred um, to, to liberate the capital city there of Manila. He authorized Eichelberger to make another series of landings west and south of Manila as a way to kind of maybe divide the Japanese attention. Um, the 11th Airborne was tasked with one of these landings further south. And this is where, again, you kind of see the unique aspects of the way Swing commanded the division. He wasn't afraid to split things up. He had originally had advocated for dropping the entirety of the 11th Airborne Division by parachute and glider south of Manila. But the reality was there just wasn't enough aircraft in the Pacific to be able to, to drop an entire division. And so Swing and Eichelberger kind of came up with what Swing referred to as half a loaf, half a loaf plan being better than than none. And to your, to your point, he landed um, almost the division in its entirety on the coast amphibiously. Um, the two glider infantry regiments were in the vanguard of that amphibious landing. Their mission was to push their way inland to seize an objective called Tagaitai Ridge. It was on that ridge that then Swing, once he was confident that his two units would be able to link up, he dropped the 511th Parachute Infantry Regiment inland there to link up with the glider troops. And again, just to give you an idea of, of the lack of aircraft, they couldn't even drop the, the regiment in its entirety. It took them uh, a day and a half, three sorties in total uh, to drop the regiment. So they came in in a couple of couple of different airwaves, so to speak. But once the 511th was on the ground and had linked up with the glider infantry regiments, they then started to punch their way north up into the southern environs of, of Manila. After Tagaytay, or Tagate, like you said, the 11th is going to get pushed up there towards Manila. And they're going to run into that Fort McKinley uh, Genko line that the, the Japanese have. Um, this is almost the toughest fight of their, I mean, all their... All their campaigns are just grueling, but this one's going to be one of the worst. And they'll actually lose their their commander in this one as well. Can you tell us about this, about the drive to into the south of Manila? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's worth noting that, you know, none of the troops in World War II really had any kind of what we would call today urban combat training. You know, they had practiced in the state seizing, you know, villages and some mock mock buildings, things like that. But what the 11th found themselves in as they were pushing up in the Manila was true urban combat, you know, um, and it was the largest urban combat in the Pacific theater. Manila at the time was, uh, had a population of just under a million people. It was, you know, the Pearl of the Orient was what it was called before uh, the Japanese occupied it in, in early 1942. And, you know, and listeners not familiar with with it should think of like Washington, D.C., as far as the opulence of the Capitol buildings and, and you know, marble columns. It was truly a an urban sprawl area. And the 11th, uh, the 511th was in the vanguard again, pushing their way up. The Genko line, as you mentioned, had been well prepared by the Japanese. It was a belt of defenses that kind of were anchored on Manila Bay and was about three or four miles wide and two miles deep. Um, they had built hundreds of pillboxes for machine guns. These were built from anything from, you know, stone, mud bricks, reinforced with palm tree logs, things of that nature. They had um, taken buses and tractors and vehicles and overturned them in the intersections, wrapping barbed wire across the vehicles and lamp posts to kind of create barricades for any troops coming down those roads. The Japanese had taken also all of these um, hundreds of aerial bombs, dug them into the ground and rigged them as landmines. And again, I think one of the most tenacious things they did was they went out in Manila Bay where some of the ships had been sunk in earlier air raids and actually salvaged guns off of some of these sunk ships and brought them inland and dug them in to the city um, at ground level to use them to cover these advances, uh, these you know routes of advance that the 11th right. Airborne would be coming up. And so you really then, to your point, they start to get into this this brutal house to house, you know, almost sometimes brick to brick fighting to take over the southern part of the city. Um, the five, you know, the the eleventh airborne is basically in the position of having to make this up as they go along because they don't have a lot of experience in house fighting. Um, they're finding that they have to they they kind of create these these squads called rat patrols that are responsible for going back behind areas that they thought had been cleared because the Japanese had kind of became infamous for leaving riflemen behind in, in attics wow. 
Wow. And they would, you know, all of a sudden find themselves being shot at from behind after having advanced up the block. So it really became just kind of a, a you know, a really brutal melee. Flamethrowers were really an important component to this. Um, Swing was commissioned as an artillery officer. And so he really um, worked hard to keep all of his artillery units um, supplied with shells. And you can, you know, you can read accounts of them just using their smaller caliber artillery pieces as as battering rams, basically pushing their way through the city. Do you know what percentage casualties they take during that fight in Manila? Uh, it's a good question, Jim. I know all told the 11th took about 30% casualties through, for the duration of the war. I, I don't have the numbers broken down yeah. by that campaign. Had they gotten any replacements since Leyte before no. they were Wow. So they're, yeah, they're, so they're all just dead from Leyte going into this one. Wow. That's right. And so, and and to your point, what you start to see happening is now is, is what really starts to hit the division badly on Luzon, just as bad as, as enemy fire and, 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 and shell fragments is disease. And so you start to see guys now who were getting sick on Leyte now on Luzon with dysentery, malaria, and so you you know some days their their casualties are 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 higher from just illness. Sickness, um, yeah. Eventually, they do start to attach some units um, to the eleventh, so swing can have some additional manpower there. But the, in the initial stages, it was all uh, all the eleventh. In the middle of that fight of when they're going into Manila, all of a sudden MacArthur tasks them with the liberation of the prison camp at Los Banos, and this will probably be their most famous jump of of the war. Can you just give us an overview of, of what happens? Sure. Um, so, you know, as you well know, when the Japanese took over the Philippine islands, they also captured several thousand um, enemy aliens or enemy, you know, civilians from enemy nations. So think of, you know, Americans, British, French, Australian, Belgian. Um, these were all civilians that were working in the Philippines as business owners or missionaries. Um, the Japanese um, corralled them into several internment camps. Um, a couple of those had been liberated in Manila during the fight for the city there. Um, Las Banos was one of these camps. It was still at this time about 15 miles behind enemy lines. There was a lot of uh, concern and suspicion that the Japanese might massacre the internees rather than set them free or evacuate them with them as they started moving back across the island. And so MacArthur um, was concerned about that for obvious reasons, tasked the 11th Airborne General Swing specifically with conducting a rescue mission. And again, this is kind of where we start to see the unique, uh, not start, this is where we see again the unique aspects of the division. Um, they initiated a ground assault on the prison camp with, uh, with Filipino guerrillas in conjunction with the division reconnaissance platoon. Um, their go sign, so to speak, to start that that ground skirmish was um, when the first paratrooper jumped out. So they dropped about 120 guys, a company of paratroopers on the outskirts of the camp. Those two elements then swept into the camp to scatter the Japanese guards. There was about 60 to 80 Japanese guards is what the uh, Filipino guerrillas estimated were guarding that facility. It was it was an amazing feat of arms. You know, they they rescued over 2000 uh, men, women and children that were inside of that compound. They suffered two fatalities. Two of the guerrillas uh, were killed in that in that ground combat. But amazingly enough, none of the uh, civilians were grievously injured. There were a couple of them that were wounded in the crossfire, but not not significantly so. Um, they used uh, dozens of amphibious vehicles that kind of cut across the lake and came ashore uh, to then turn around and evacuate all of the um, all of the internees. And it's also from an 11th Airborne perspective, it's interesting to note that this is where they began what what I refer to as their one sided rivalry with the Marine Corps. Um, mm. The Marines, I don't think, ever knew that they were in a rivalry with the 11th Airborne. But that same day that that mission uh, was unfolding, what the, the Marines were fighting very hard on Iwo Jima. And the next morning on Stars and Stripes and Yank and all those, uh, the 11th expected to have front page right. coverage of this awesome rescue mission that they had initiated. And they grabbed the papers to find that famous photo of the flag going up on Mount Siribachi. And so the 11th veterans often often malign the Marines for stealing their thunder on 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 that great that great rescue mission. Because it, it really 
it really is a text, the textbook operation of World War II. I mean, they don't they don't lose anybody. They don't lose any of the prisoners. I mean, I, it, 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 it's a stunning operation, you know, that they they pull off there. I agree. And it's and it's also stunning when you think about the fact that they had zero time to train for it. I mean, the guys <laughs> were literally briefed on it that morning. Um, and then the next day they were all back in the front lines, yeah. you know, so it, it's it's literally one day. In it shows how 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 well trained they were. You know, that's right. How how adept they were at that time. I mean, I agree. And after this, you know, even even though the war's you know waning down, you talk about the when they start going after these last pockets of Japanese um, down in the south. You know, that are in in these mountain areas. And the thing that got me is is and I don't and I, I just want to ask you. Um, you know, they find these gullies, these ravines, and there's like two to three hundred. Filipinos just executed in there. How does that affect those guys in the airborne? I mean, I mean, how does it does it just rile them beyond? Does anybody even talk about it? You know, does that come through? Absolutely. I think it's it's a great question. And it's, you know, it started um, it started with just, you know, the guys being frustrated, fed up, annoyed, whatever words you want to use with just the the constant unwillingness of the enemy to give up first and foremost, right? It was just constantly a slog. And so this idea of mopping up is really kind of a, a poor euphemism to use for these operations. Because again, every time you go into combat against these guys, they're unwilling to give up. They're going to fight to the death. And their sole mission in life is to take as many of you with them as possible, right? So it just became, so there's that. And then you start, to your point, adding in these atrocities, um, which the 11th started witnessing when they came into Manila. You know, Manila was just this uh, horrific scene of atrocities that the Japanese were perpetrating against the Filipino people there, ostensibly initially going after Filipino guerrillas. But the definition of what a guerrilla was expanded wildly during this time frame and, and thousands and tens of thousands of, of, of atrocities occurred in Manila. Um, and then to your point, as they as they pushed across the island, they found more and more evidence of this. And there certainly was a, you know, there was a specific incident that I recount in the book where a platoon leader marched his men past some of these, um, you know, murdered Filipino yeah. civilians. And he told his men right there, he said, look at this and don't ever forget the reason why we're why we are here. And so I think it definitely made an impact on them. You know, the Filipino people have been extremely welcoming to the 11th Airborne. There's, you know, little bands hopping up when they're making their push into Manila, six man band playing the Star Spangled Banner. They're handing them, you know, very similar to what troops experienced in Europe, you know. On yeah. a, and so they had quite an affection for the Philippine islands and, and the people there. And so this definitely had a tremendous impact, negative impact on them as to how they uh, what they saw there. I don't see how any of those guys even go home with that, you know, and live with that, you know, and I, I that's war, uh, you know, throughout the ages, I guess. But, you know, it's just it, it's very stark, very, very, very stark. They finally get one last jump at the end of the war. Uh, well, not really the end, but like about June up towards the north Luzon. But it's kind of anticlimactic, isn't it? Yeah, I think it, it was interesting. That was one of those where they finally did drop, you know, the reg they mustered enough aircraft to have a really sizable uh, regimental drop. They even uh, dropped a couple of gliders. I want to say six gliders that had Jeeps in the back with, you know, radios and things like that. And so, um, but the troops, them all, all the troops that, that participated in it viewed it pretty much as a training jump, although it was technically called a combat operation. I think uh, I could the only thing I could track down was that they encountered one dehydrated Japanese soldier on the edge of the drop zone. And the guys were all pretty mad about it because the winds were really high and the drop uh, the drop zone itself was just like baked mud. So it was almost right. like dropping on the asphalt. There were a number of jump injuries mm. um, there. And so and the drop zone had already been secured by um, some American advisors with their with their Filipino guerrilla units. And so one of the, one of the veterans joked to me, "Yeah, if you meet a guy from that jump, you do not owe him a cup of coffee." <laughs> now, was that was that something that Kruger pushed on them? Uh, I, I think the answer to that is yes. General it, Walter Kruger, I mean, yeah, that's Dick right. It, that was one of those things that kind of it felt like when you go back and you read the after action reports and you try to get a sense of what was going on. It was one of those things where the wheels had been put in motion and nobody wanted to be the person to call it off, so to speak. Right. Wow. Now, at the war's end, the 11th is picked to be the first army unit in Japan. 
um, what happens? I mean, they go in there and they then they they set up in in North Japan um, and start jump schools there. But what happens to the 11th Airborne to these guys after after the war? Yeah. So to your point, they became some of the first troops into Japan. They uh, were responsible for seizing um, Atsugi Airfield right outside of Tokyo, which is where MacArthur eventually lands um, to then go accept a formal surrender. Um, not long after that, the 11th is kind of sent up north to begin occupation duty. And this is kind of where we see, you know, the points story kind of unfold, right? Everybody's looking at their points to see if they're going to be sent home. And it's kind of an interesting story. I mean, the 11th uh, guys who kind of were drafted or enlisted into the army late in late in the war, 1945, found themselves showing up at the 11th Airborne Division as replacement troops with the war being over. And um, the veterans of the unit who elected not to reenlist kind of just started going home in, in drips and drabs. So for them, there was no victory parade. There was no yeah. kind of monumental homecoming, if you will. They just kind of literally went back in ones and twos as as space became available on these ships home and kind of had the responsibility of, you know, trying to figure out how to integrate back into society. And to your point, many of them, you know, now, of course, were much more familiar with the impact of post-traumatic stress and traumatic yeah. brain injury. And, you know, these guys were very close to large amounts of ordnance going off in that Philippine campaign. And so there's no doubt in my mind that many of them, you know, suffered from traumatic brain injury. Sure things of that nature. And so, you know, and you can see it, it was kind of a, you know, a smorgasbord of, of, of responses. Some guys, you know, drank themselves to death to cope with it. Many of them just kind of put their heads down and reintegrated, got jobs, went to college, got married, you know, the whole, you know, kind of the, the story we're kind of all familiar with. James, thanks very much for being with us today. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the 11th. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.